ago at the uh, World Nutrition Conference, and he had a poster display uh, up there that somehow I felt not enough people were looking at. I was bringing my friends over, but uh, four years ago they weren't paying attention to the fact that he showed a world map of, uh, uh, of the sun areas and the shady areas and showing the differences in cancer rates. Finally, I think the world has recognized it in the last two years, and uh, he must have written, I don't know, is it, about, is it a dozen papers, Bill, or more that you've written? Sixty. Sixty. <laughs> well, the last two are uh, uh, hypothesis ultraviolet V irradiance of vitamin D reduces the risk of viral infections, and thus the sequel, including autoimmune diseases and some cancers. And this is going to appear in an issue of photochemistry and photobiology to com commemorate the 60th birthday of Dr. Hassan Mukhtar. And uh, he also, in the uh, newsletter, the last uh, section includes uh, key issues that came from another article he wrote that went into perspectives of uh, ex expert review of dermatology. Anyway, uh, just a little about his background. He has a PhD in physics from UC Berkeley, spent 30 years in, profession, in a professional career devoted to developing and using laser systems for the remote measurement of atmospheric constituents. During the last 15 years of his career, he worked in the atmospheric sciences at NASA Langley Research Center in Virginia, where he participated in many field programs to study the remote atmosphere. During his stay in Virginia, he began the study of diet and solar ultraviolet B, UVB links to chronic diseases. He retired in 2004, moved to San Francisco. That was the year at the conference that we met, where he established Sunlight Nutrition and Health Research Center, SunArc, to extend his health studies. So I give you Bill Grant. organization the past three or four years and it's always a pleasure to interact with people here and get good questions and, and good feedback and, and uh, so it's a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Bill, can you speak up just uh, It looks like your thing's not turned down or something. Yeah, why don't you give him the mic? Oh, that's okay. 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 Sure. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe a dead battery. <laughs> I haven't studied the effect of vitamin D3 on the voice yet, but I'll have to look into that. Um, I'd like to thank Mark Sorensen for uh, formatting these slides for me. Um, he was the author of the book Solar Power, and there's one copy left over there for sale. Um, he's got it here, so I have to press the button each time to get uh, uh, to advance it. Uh, I consider this the golden age of vitamin D research. Um, it's the new findings being reported uh, weekly, and if vitamin D can be patented and sold for huge profits, you would see it advertised everywhere. Um, instead, the establishment tries to suppress the information of vitamin D in order to maintain the high profit rates on, in our disease treatment uh, health system. And I think most of you are probably aware of that already. Um, and as John Cannell, who was uh, supposed to be here tonight but couldn't make it, uh, says, Linus Pauling was on the right track, but just off by one letter. <laughs> I do receive funding funny this year from the indoor tanning industry from the United States, Canada, and uh, Europe, and uh, I'm grateful for that um, uh, sponsorship. Now, I'll be talking about a number of uh, things tonight. Uh, it's, uh, a lot has happened in the past year. Uh, I'll go first into definitions, just mention bone diseases, a lot to say on cancer. Uh, the new story, for, as far as I'm concerned, is, is the effect of, of, of vitamin D on viral and, and bacterial infections. Uh, there's a story on autism that's uh, being developed. There's autoimmune diseases like multiple sclerosis. The other big thing I'm looking into now is the metabolic diseases. Your heart disease, strokes, diabetes, hypertension. Vitamin D plays a role there. 
uh, also seems to play a role for brain and cognitive function. And uh, this has been found to um, uh, uh, reduce mortality rates. Uh, we'll talk a little about vitamin D sources and, and problems with UV and, and sources. Now, definitions. It's important to understand a few of the terms involved before going too far. First, we have vitamin D3 or cholecalciferol. That's made in the skin from a type of cholesterol uh, interacting with the shortwave ultraviolet radiation called UVB. And it then goes through a thermal process uh, before it gets in, uh, absorbed into the blood. And um, uh, this is just the spectral regions. 95% uh, of the ultraviolet radiation hitting their surface is in the long wave or UVA region, and then 5% is in the UVB region. Um, in the liver, the vitamin D3 is con converted into 25 hydroxy vitamin D3, or what we call calcidiol, and the calcidiol is converted in the kidney to the 125 dihydroxy D3 or calcitriol. Now this is the hormonal version. So if you increase your amount of vitamin D3 through supplements or through sunlight, you'll make more of the calcitriol, and then the kidney and other organs will make the, the calcitriol. Um, the, what the pharmaceutical companies do and the doctors try to sell is an analog version of the calcitriol because that's where they make money and that's what you use to treat diseases uh, more directly. But when I go to the conferences where, they, where the pharmaceutical companies show up and talk about their analogs, I point out that, that uh, for example, in Norway and in, in England and in Boston, people diagnosed with cancer in summer or fall have a better survival rate than those diagnosed in winter or spring. And so they don't, don't need these fancy uh, uh, analogs. They can just go out in the sun or take supplements and get a benefit in, in fighting cancer and other diseases. And they keep inviting me back to the conferences, so I think I must be doing something right. Um, okay, now, we have also have vitamin D receptors, and they grab onto the calcium trial and let it interact with, with the organ of interest. Uh, and I should have said earlier that, that uh, not only does the, the kidney make the, the calcium trial, but also the organs, like the breast, the prostate, uh, the colon, and so on, if they need calcium trial to fight whatever they're fighting, they will make it from the circulating form of, of, of vitamin D calcidiol. And the VDRs come in different alleles or flavors. Some are more helpful than others. There's some difference by racial type. Um, I haven't really studied that in detail, but, but there are things that can be looked into there. And the half-life of vitamin D3 is about four to six weeks. So it's not like vitamin C that's water soluble and, and it stays about an hour or two. This will actually stay in the fat for a few weeks. And so you can take a daily dose, a weekly dose, or a monthly dose and, and get the same benefit. So if you decide you need 2,000 IU per day, you can take 15,000 IU per week or 60,000 IU per month and get the same effect. Uh, now there's a vitamin D2, and you have to be careful when you go to, to uh, look for, for vitamin D in the stores. D2 is made from vegetable matter, and it's much less effective than D3. Uh, so I'd recommend staying away from D2 and making sure you get the D3. Now, bone diseases, uh, that's where they first realized that vitamin D was effective. Rickets was the first vitamin D deficiency disease. And in fact, the reason that we have 400 IU uh, vitamin D recommended as the daily minimum dose is that the amount of vitamin D in a teaspoon of cod liver oil, and that fought rickets. I mean, it's only been the last 20, 25 years they realize that there are other than calcium effects, and so now they have to reevaluate the whole thing. Uh, they didn't realize that vitamin D fought osteoporosis and other bone diseases until the 1960s or so. Um, and uh, one loses calcium due to reduced uh, calcium and calcium trial, reduced absorption of calcium, and increased uh, parathyroid hormone secretion. So it's a Anyways, one ages, one has to worry about uh, the different effects. Also, if you lose females lose uh, estrogen, they'll also um, won't be putting on as much calcium into the bones. Um, so, like I said earlier, it was thought just to be used for, for trace minerals, for mineral absorption, calcium, phosphorus, and magnesium. Um, and as far as I can tell, I'm still trying to verify this, I think that the interest in going from calcium to the non-calcemic effects 
starting with the garlands, suggesting that sunlight through the production of vitamin D reduce the risk of uh, cancer, or colon cancer. And uh, the ecological approach is what they used. That's where you define populations, uh, or populations are defined geographically. Instead of, a, you know, instead of cases or cohorts, you, you're looking at a whole population. You look at the disease outcomes averaged at the population level, and you look at the uh, risk modifying factors averaged at the population level as well. And you use a suitable uh, lag between the risk factor and the disease outcome. Um, now, John Snow was probably the first ecologist. Uh, he um, uh, looked at the um, um, map of, of, of deaths from cholera in London um, and found that they all sort of centered on a, a, a pump on Broad Street. And here's the replica of the pump. I visited it last month when I was uh, in uh, England. It's right near the John Snow uh, pub. So you have a pint there and you think about uh, John Snow and his contribution to modern uh, science. Uh, he didn't know what was causing cholera, but he said just remove the pump handle and cholera will disappear. And it did. And that's the same sort of thing with, with, um, with, with uh, Cedric Garland. Um, you've got sun, it's maybe vitamin D. Uh, in 1985, he showed, yes, that, that dietary vitamin D had a role to play. In 1989, he showed that the serum calcidiol was a risk reduction factor. But it's taken another decade or two for the community to wake up to what he was finding back then. So like I said, the Garlands made the first um, uh, ecological study and uh, made the hypothesis. And here's the kind of map uh, they looked at. Uh, you have the highest rates and the red up in the northeast, the lowest the blue in the southwest. And if you look at the summertime ultraviolet B radiation, it has an inverse pattern. Um, the, the lowest rates of vitamin D of UVB are in the northeast, the highest in the southwest. And the reason you don't have just a, a latitudinal effect is that in the western United States, the surface elevation is higher, so you have people closer to the sun, there's less absorption and scattering by the atmosphere. And as the winds come across the ocean and try to cross the Rocky Mountains, they raise, they raise the tropopause height and narrow the stratosphere, so they have less ozone in the west. And so for those two reasons, you have more UVB hitting the Earth's surface. Now, my contribution, when I looked at the new atlas that came out in 1999, I said, well, you know, there are five cancers, breast, colon, ovarian, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and prostate cancer that are thought to be vitamin D. But you look at the maps and they all look the same. Kidney disease, stomach cancer, um, and so on. And so I said, well, why aren't they all considered vitamin D sensitive diseases? And so I, I, I got that, so this, this map from, from NASA, from NASA Goddard, from the total ozone mapping spectrometer, and spent a couple of months digitizing this map to the same resolution as these maps. So I had to go to a, a detailed road map and I had to sort of look, eyeball each, each set of counties. There's 500 state economic areas and carefully make a correspondence. And then I was able to show that yes, there were 13 or 14 types of cancer that were UVB and vitamin D sensitive. Well, I published it, it was funny, I, I submitted it to the Journal of Cancer, which is operated by the American Cancer Society. And the referees said, well, it's a great paper, just send it to the technical editor, uh, the English isn't very good. So I did that and, and it was published. And then the American Cancer Society people looked at it and said, well, gee golly, you know, there are other factors that cause cancer or affect cancer, not just UV and vitamin D. And we know that UV causes skin cancer, so we're not we're about to endorse vitamin D and UV as reducing the risk of cancer. So I, I, I got um, the index of smoking, which was lung cancer. I took it and put in alcohol, Hispanic heritage, urban residence, poverty, redid the analysis, sent it back to cancer, and they rejected it. I sent to another journal, they had a review, they rejected it. I sent to nine journals, they all rejected it. Finally got it published last year as a conference proceedings paper in a Greek journal, and it's now it's, it's had uh, 18, 19 citations, which puts the top 1% of papers published in that last year. But, but you know, the establishment just didn't want to admit that, that uh, I guess that was the real story. Um, we have now identified over 20 types of cancer that are UVB and vitamin D sensitive. And what is also interesting is a study published last year 
found that the effect of UVB on cancer rates was stronger for mortality rates than for incidence rates. And that, that's significant for a couple of reasons. One is that a lot of the studies on cancer incidence don't always find an effect of vitamin D on cancer incidence. But what the other implication is that the, the farther along the cancer is, the more effective vitamin D is in fighting it. And I think if you look at the mechanisms of cancer, it sort of makes sense. Cancer starts not from lack of vitamin D, but starts from a, 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 either, either from a carcinogen or from just normal metabolism or, or the wrong kind of food or something, and you get cancer starting. And then it sort of grows, and if you smoke, if you drink alcohol, if you have too much animal products in your diet, et cetera, et cetera, you have all sorts of things that, that help cancer go along. But what vitamin D does, um, among other things, is it reduces the formation of blood vessels around the cancer tumors, and it helps inhibit the metastasis. So it really helps fight things later on in, in the cancer um, um, growth curve. And in support of this, they found that in Norway, in England, and Boston, people diagnosed with cancer in summer, fall, I think I mentioned, uh, live longer than those diagnosed in winter or spring. So it really does have an effect on, on, on treating cancer. Unfortunately, I, I have found it very, very difficult to get any doctors, uh, any hospitals, any organizations to recommend uh, vitamin D to those who, who develop cancer. Um, so we, we did that study with the other multi-factors. We still found 15 types of cancer that were sensitive to UVB, 10 linked to smoking, 9 to alcohol, 3 to Hispanic heritage, and 1 to latitude. And latitude is my index for wintertime uh, UVB and vitamin D. And I'll discuss the significance of this finding uh, a little bit later in the talk. Now Harvard, I showed my results to the Ed Giovannucci at Harvard in 2002. And at that time, they were just using dietary factors to look at the effect of, of vitamin D on cancer. But after I talked to him, he said, well, let's, he would put in a UVB index. And in doing so, he found inverse correlations about seven types of cancers and reduced but not significant effects for another five types of cancer. And he estimated that male cancer deaths in the United States could be reduced by 29% for 1,500 IU of vitamin D3 per day. Uh, Harvard is now one of the big supporters of the vitamin D uh, hypothesis. Uh, uh, Fifteen hundred IU of vitamin D3 per day. Um, now, the critics who don't want to accept this say that, well, gee golly, uh, just because somebody lives where it's sunny doesn't mean they're getting a lot of vitamin D. And um, so I, I, as a result of that, I figured, okay, there's a simple way to do that. If they get non-melanoma skin cancer, which they will admit is due to too much UVB, then that's an index of lifetime development of uh, uh, exposure to UVB. And sure enough, um, looked at, um, did a meta-analysis, this one line is out of place, but it turns out that uh, this is for colon cancer. And this, but unfortunately, smoking is a risk factor for non-melanoma skin cancer and for many other types of cancer. So on the horizontal axis, I have lung cancer, and on the vertical axis, I have colon cancer. But as you march along, you see that if you, if you go to higher rates for both. But if you come to where the lung cancer mortality rate or uh, incidence rate for that group is the same as the average population, there is a significant risk reduction factor for, for colon cancer. Um, and uh, okay, this is shown for quite a few types of cancer. Uh, what I also showed was that for Spain, uh, if I used non-melanoma skin cancer for women as the index and looked at breast cancer, the greater the amount of non-melanoma skin cancer in the population, the lower the amount of, of breast cancer. So this did seem to indicate that, that indeed at the population level still, uh, it, you have an index that's inversely correlated with, with cancer risk. Uh, another paper came out recently uh, looking at uh, data from sunny and less sunny countries, looking at registry data for people who had uh, um, non-melanoma skin cancer and, and uh, or all types of
types of skin cancer and other types of cancer. And for squamous cell carcinoma, um, they found a 21% reduction in other uh, solid cancers. For basal cell carcinoma, a uh, uh, 14%, and for melanoma, it was uh, insignificant. In the less sunny countries, on the other hand, they found if you got skin cancer, they had a greater risk of, of other cancers. Well, if you, if you think about not less sunny countries like Norway, if they're out in the sun, they're just exposed to their head and, and their neck and their hands, or they go to a, to a sunny vacation spot. So they're not really able to get much vitamin D from being in the sun. And um, uh, there are probably other reasons they get cancer. But, but anyway, th this again supported the idea that UV does uh, reduce the risk of uh, cancer. Uh, there are a number of different ways that um, one can, indices that one can use. Uh, There's a study that came out uh, last week or two showing that cerium, uh, pre diagnostic of vitamin D in, in calcidiol only had a bit of a correlation with breast cancer and colon cancer and did not have an effect on all cancer uh, mortality rates. Well, um, that's probably the least, least good index to use for, for such studies, so that study can be more or less ignored. Um, if we look at the number of observational studies on UVB and cancer risk reduction, we have more than 10 for the, the big six or seven. Seven to nine on these, including uh, several cancers linked to smoking. Uh, we have five or six on renal and Hodgkin's lymphoma. Uh, three to four on these, um, two on these, and just one of these. So total, we have about 20 cancers with two or more studies, five cancers with one study. Uh, there are some cancers like liver cancer where vitamin D doesn't seem to play any role whatsoever, but for many types of cancer, it seems to play a very important role. Um, now there was a, another study came out in June uh, from um, Nebraska. They took uh, over a thousand women and gave about half, they divided into three groups. Some got 1,100 IU of vitamin D3 uh, and or 1,400 milligrams of calcium per day or placebo. Uh, they, they, if they looked after, between the end of the first year and the end of the fourth year, there was a 70, there was a 77 percent reduction in the all cancer incidence rate, uh, and this was highly significant. Um, now, the baseline calcidiol levels were at the sort of the population average. There's 28 nanomograms per milliliter. By by taking the vitamin D supplement, they went up to more like 55 or 60 nanograms per milliliter. And now this study's been criticized by people who, who don't know better and say, well, cancer takes 20 years to go from start to finish. This was a four-year study. How can we affect a vitamin D effect, a study uh, effect to be found in only four years? Well, the answer is because vitamin D is much more effective the farther along it goes. So all these people probably had 10 or 15 years of development of cancer, but it didn't reach the, the stage where it would be detected uh, for most of the people in the study. Um, Dose response relations. Um, we, we have, by looking at some of the serum uh, calcidiol measurements in cancer risk, uh, we have been able to find, uh, for example, that for colorectal cancer, 1,500 IU per day uh, translates to a 50% reduction. But for breast cancer, it seems to take 3,600 uh, international units per day. Uh, here's an example of, of the kind of uh, data that, that are obtained in such a study. Okay, the, the nitpickers on the other side like to say, well, there's some problems. They're just like the global climate change and the COC ozone thing. Those whose economic ops is being gored like to say, well, yeah, hey, there's some problems that, that, that sort of counter your theory, so maybe we won't buy the whole theory. Uh, for example, prostate cancer is not at all well correlated with pre-diagnostic serum calcidiol. Uh, pancreatic cancer is not inversely correlated with, with uh, calcidiol in Finland. And esophageal cancer was directly correlated with calcium and calcidiol in China. Well, I have, I have explanations for these. Um, first of all, viral infections may be uh, important risk factors for prostate cancer, in the, and, and, and these are viral infections in youth and, and early adulthood. And that by, with the vitamin D fighting the viral infections, it can uh, fight the cancer so that you get the pattern that we see. <coughs> but it's not going to affect uh, so much in the middle stages. 
uh, for example, in, in the Nordic countries where they've had a problem with, with pancreatic cancer, it turns out that calcium is a risk factor for pancreatic cancer, and they fortify milk in, in the Nordic countries and with vitamin D, and they, they don't get much vitamin D from sunlight. So it could be those that get more vitamin D are getting it from their milk. And um, as far as esophageal cancer goes, uh, turns out that the people, the, 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 the area where they studied in China, that's a rural climate, we have a lot of farmers. Okay, farmers are out in the sun more, so they get more vitamin D from sunlight because they don't fortify any food, and in, inland they're not getting vitamin D from fish. So all their vitamin D is going to come from sunlight. It turns out that uh, human papillomavirus is an important risk factor for esophageal cancer, especially in China. And it turns out that UV, both UVA and UVB, impair the immune system, and so that could, and it works on HPV. So I submitted a letter saying that the reason for that funny finding in, in China is because you have two effects competing, and, and uh, using an index for UV exposure, that the, uh, vitamin D is an index of UV exposure, but it's not really an index of fighting the cancer because you're stimulating the cancer by uh, letting the HPV uh, be increased. So it's, as I you know, realized, in, in, in part of the reason I, I quit NASA early to study health was that I found this study so fascinating, and there's just all these wrinkles, these little puzzles that, 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 that are out there to, to be uh, found. Uh, okay, most of the evidence is observational and ecological studies. Um, current medical practice is based on evidence-based medicine. In other words, they want randomized, controlled, prospective, double-blind studies, which I say is appropriate for drugs, but maybe not for natural components of diet and lifestyle. Uh, now, A.B. Hill, in 1965, laid down the criteria for causality in a biological system. And uh, in my opinion, these criteria are generally satisfied for cancer. If you take the broad picture, if you look at enough studies and you sort of say, do we have strength of association? Yes, we have that in a lot of studies. We repeat it in many diverse populations. We've shown it in China, Japan, Europe, the United States, and Australia. Uh, we have linear dose response relationships. We've accounted for confounding factors. We understand the mechanisms. We now have experimental verification. And we have cause preceding the effect. Um, but without uh, more randomized, controlled, prospective studies, there's still going to be the people say, well, it isn't proven yet. Now, okay, that's it for cancer for the most for the first part. Now I want to get into a new area, the respiratory viral diseases and, and the benefit of vitamin D here. And I, I, in my own case, I credit John Cannell uh, for stimulating my interest in this by his um, uh, paper on explaining seasonal influenza in terms of seasonal variation of UVB and vitamin D. I was a co-author in this paper. Uh, my contribution was actually to show that there are other things that cause a seasonality, such as cold temperature and, and um, it turns out, relative humidity. There are th three things that give rise to these viral infections in winter. Uh, if, if you're cold, then your capillaries contract, and so your white blood cells don't get to the surface of the respiratory system, and so we can't fight the viruses as they come into your system. When it's cold, there's also the relative humidity is very low, and that means that, that um, when you exhale a virus, it doesn't grow into a large droplet because there's not the moisture in the air to accumulate as it transports. And so we have these smaller particles, which are more easily uh, taken into your respiratory system. And then if you don't have vitamin D to fight the uh, virus once it lodges, you have a third strike against you. So that, that's why a lot of these, vir these diseases are common in winter. Uh, so John, John Cannell, he, he's a psychiatrist he's, you know, down in Southern California. And he actually had a personal a professional experience that led his, uh, to, to his developing this hypothesis. Uh, it had to do with the people in his hospital. He was giving those in his ward vitamin D, and uh, turns out um, they were not getting as uh, sick as the rest of the other people. And about that time, uh, a, a group at UCLA published a paper showing that um, there's an antimicrobial peptide called cath cathelicidin, 
that fights virus, they, they actually showed it fight it, uh, fought tuberculosis. Uh, uh, but um, it turns out it also fights viral infections. So he, he did some uh, study on his patients, but wasn't able to show that he had a, a significant effect. But, but anyway, stimulated his research on, on the topic, and we published that paper. Now, we did get con experimental confirmation from a, a study in New York State. This was a, a, a physician with about 208 African-American postmenopausal women living in New York. And he was giving them a vitamin D supplementation study for a study on calcium. But fortunately, he asked them every three months when they came in, uh, have you had a cold or influenza in the past three months? And was able to tabulate that. The blue here are those on the placebo. 30 of them developed a cold or influenza during one of those periods over the three-year program. Uh, six developed um, uh, cold or influenza on 800 IU per day. And only one developed cold or influenza on the 2,000 IU per day. So again, this sort of brackets the dose that we're recommending now between 800 and 2,000 IU per day. Um, there's also work on respiratory syncytial virus, which gives rise to bronchitis and maybe pneumonia. And it was shown that, um, uh, it, that if they looked at the cases every week and looked at the temperature, the humidity, uh, the rainfall, and the UVB, that in Miami they had a 13% effective UVB. In um, New York they had a 5% effect, and in Winnipeg, Manitoba, they had a 0.6% effect. So we had a seasonal effect and a latitudinal effect, which again is consistent with the UVB uh, hypothesis. Uh, so, it's, it's, um, so it's the hormonal metabolite of vitamin D that induces the production of cathelicidin, which is a component of the innate immune system. Uh, and explains uh, this effect for, for bacteria and viral infections in winter. What this, now I read recently that they're finding that the influenza vaccine is not very effective for older people. I mean, part of the reason is that older people's immune system starts to wind down. And because you have different strains of, of influenza virus, and it takes about a year to go from developing the antibodies to, to actually give, putting out the, the, the vaccine, and the influenza may mutate in the meantime. So uh, when I was in London, I contacted half a dozen uh, influenza researchers suggesting they look into vitamin D. Then the body to reply. It's just they're part of the system that wants to sell vaccine and treat people and so on. And so just like water from dust bath. Now, I made another contribution recently uh, on sepsis. Sepsis is, is the blood um, poisoning from, from bacteria. Uh, you get it in hospitals, and you can get it from you know infections or whatever. Um, it's it's um, uh, has these epidemiological features in the United States. It's highest in the Northeast, lowest in the Southwest, highest in the winter, lowest in the fall, higher in Black Americans, lower in White Americans. There's a rapid increase with age, and the comorbid diseases are vitamin D sensitive. What more I can explain it than UVB and vitamin D? So I, I submitted to um, uh, one journal, um, uh, infectious, it was an American journal that goes to the physicians and tells them the latest things they know for, should know for treating their patients. And they said, well, you know, without experimental, ver experimental verification, we can't really send that to our, our physicians. So I submitted to the same journal that John Cannell submitted his, his um, influenza manuscript to this week, and, and it's going through review there. And, and, um, I chose some good reviewers who, who, who I think will, will say, yes, that, that's right. And, and so we'll should accept it hope, hope, soon, I think. And 120,000 Americans die each year from sepsis. So it's, it's a very important um, uh, problem. And they're, I guess they're developing now. There are strains being, more and more strains are being developed that are antibiotic resistant. So it would seem that those people going to a hospital for an operation or going to the hospital for any reason should probably be given high doses of vitamin D to boost their immune system in the, uh, unlikely, in the event that they get uh, 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 an infection like this. Well, there's, a, there's an article on sepsis in the last issue of Science News, and I just looked at it today, so I remember it was the, now say the 200,000 deaths. Okay, stand corrected. Uh, autoimmune diseases. Um, 
These diseases uh, include multiple sclerosis, uh, type 1 diabetes, autism, um, psoriasis, uh, I'm sure you can name others. And um, uh, many times it appears that, that viral infections are a risk factor for these, these diseases. Uh, the virus can embed itself in various tissues and can live for many years with few symptoms. Uh, as the body tries to fight the, the infection, it may generate an autoimmune response. Uh, multiple sclerosis, for example, um, the, the, uh, the, the viral uh, infection there is Epstein-Barr, which often manifests itself as infectious mononucleosis. It's well known that UVB and vitamin D reduce the risk of MS. Uh, the prevalence of MS increases with increasing latitude in Australia, Europe, South of the Nordic countries, and the United States. Uh, Here is my <laughs> ecological study of uh, multiple sclerosis prevalence from veterans uh, at time of uh, enrollment into World War II and the Korean conflict. Uh, the correlation is very, very good with latitude. It's, not, it's only half as good with UVB. And so latitude number is my index of wintertime uh, vitamin D. And wintertime is when most viral infections occur. And so uh, my hypothesis is that UVB through production of vitamin D and cephalocidin reduces MS by fighting the viral infections early in life, especially in youth, when the viral infections are more, more common. Uh, this is uh, related to the simple uh, gradient. Now it turns out those with MS get some benefit from vitamin D but it doesn't cure the disease. I really think it's this viral infection at the beginning is where the vitamin D plays the most important role. Uh, in fact, this manuscript is one of the ones he said was uh, be published next May. Um, uh, it, it, it's, it's in there. Now, you may have heard that, that schizophrenia might be uh, had a seasonal uh, variation of birth rate. More people born with that, that develop schizophrenia later in life are born in spring, fewer in fall. And John McGrath, for, for about a decade now, has been uh, in Australia, has been saying, well. That's related to uh, uh, vitamin D, maternal vitamin D levels, which are lowest in winter. And he's, I think, was also trying to link it to infectious disease like influenza. Well, we finally have an explanation for this. And we know that vitamin D reduces the risk of influenza and other viral infectious diseases. We know that when one has a viral infection, the, the, the body temperature rises. And we know that higher maternal body temperature is a risk factor for birth defects. Um, so now we have a plausible mechanism whereby the vitamin D reduces the risk of, of being born with schizophrenia and quite a few other um, uh, diseases and conditions. It turns out I think that even being left-handed has a seasonal variation higher in spring. Uh, I don't know if that's related, uh, but <laughs> there are things like this that, that are worth looking into. Uh, Okay, now, back to cancer. Turns out that viral infections pose a risk for a number of cancer types. Uh, the well-known known ones are cervical cancer, for which they developed a vaccine, esophageal cancer, nasopharyngeal cancer, and lymphoma. There are also the less well-known known ones, bladder, gastric, prostate, testicular, and thyroid cancer. Uh, turns out, as I mentioned earlier, that, that UV uh, can suppress the immune system. Um, and so you, some of these cancers, it, it seems that UV immunosuppression plays an important role in, in cancer risk. Um, and that's true for cervical cancer, uh, it's true for all of these. Um, um, okay, now we go on to the, the, the where it can be beneficial. Uh, the uh, prostate cancer map is very similar to that for multiple sclerosis in the United States. That's pointed out by Gary Schwartz back in 1992. And we also know that pre-diagnostic serum calcidiol levels have very little correlation with prostate cancer <coughs> incidence rates. Uh, there are many indications that young men have more genital uh, infections than older men, and viruses can lead to cancer uh, via uh, the inflammation that they develop. Uh, here's the, the um, cancer map, and what you notice that in the northwest, you have a lot of uh, prostate cancer which is not typical for the breast cancer, the colon cancer, and the other cancers. So this indicated, I've thought for many years, that this indicated a wintertime effect, 
and um, so I'm now proposing that um, that it is the uh, fighting the viral infections, uh, especially in youth, uh, which explains it. Um, the other common cancers, the breast, colon, and ovarian cancer, uh, don't have, they have neither this latitudinal component nor is it known that, that viral infections play an important role. But for the other cancers I mentioned, testicular, thyroid, bladder, um, one or two others, uh, there is evidence in the literature that, that viral infections do play an important role. On the metabolic diseases, um, this is I'm just getting into, but, but there, and there's a lot of observational data. There aren't the prospective studies yet, but there are a lot of good observational data that vitamin D, that people with low vitamin D have a lot of these metabolic, or more likely have metabolic diseases. These can include um, uh, myocardial infarction or heart attack, hypertension, stroke, type 2 diabetes, and there are a lot of the literature in the uh, paper in the literature. Here's uh, data from 1998. On the left, we have the, um, okay, on the, on the right, uh, uh, okay, the risk of uh, ISD is two, one and a half to one. So at the higher latitudes, they have more uh, ischemic heart disease. In the left, we see the, the four maps of, of vitamin D deficiency in the various seasons in, in England. And you see that they have more vitamin D deficiency at the higher latitudes. So this is sort of an ecological study showing that uh, vitamin D seems to explain some of the risk for uh, heart disease, uh, heart attacks there. Um, also turns out that for hemodialysis patients, uh, those um, using uh, more, uh, more vitamin D um, have um, less, less risk. Uh, what are the mechanisms? Uh, there's some control um, through the renin angiotensin system. Now, I'm not a biologist or anything. I don't quite understand it, but 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 um, the vitamin D does uh, affect uh, the. Um, well, this will affect the, the blood pressure. Um, there is also an effect of parathyroid hormone levels uh, and arterial calcification. In other words, if you have too much, if you have low vitamin D, you have higher PTH. That then wants to maintain calcium balance in the in the arteries, and so it's pull in the serum. So it's pulling calcium out of the bones and maybe putting it in the soft tissues, like in the arteries. So you start getting arterial calcification. Um, vitamin D also increases insulin sensitivity. Um, okay, that's that's on the metabolic diseases. We have new effects on on the brain. Um, and I think this is sort of an emerging uh, topic, which I'm not sure that much is known about. But uh, there are a couple papers in literature now uh, that people with with more vitamin D have better cognitive performance and uh, a better mood, uh, less depression. Um, there's uh, Bruce Ames uh, and Joyce McCann. Bruce was here about a year ago. Uh, Joyce works for him doing reviews. Uh, she, um, the two key things uh, from her, her work were that the vitamin D receptors are found in the brain. Anytime you have vitamin D receptors, that means there's probably a function for vitamin D because nature is, is stingy or, 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 or economical or something. If it doesn't need it, it's going to get rid of it. So if it has it, it must have a use for it. And we also know that, that vitamin inflammation plays an important role in brain function, and vitamin D can reduce inflammation. Here's a chart from a paper that's now in press by, by Joyce and Bruce. It's just showing some of the flow diagram whereby vitamin D uh, can affect some of the things that affect the brain. Uh, I think it's, uh, some of these are suggested, some are um, um, actually found through treatment. <coughs> Uh, there are also um, target genes in biochemical cellular brain function. I, I don't you understand. Know, I just want to show that there there is mounting evidence that that vitamin D affects the brain. So, uh, if, if if fighting cancer or influenza uh, or or something isn't enough, maybe the effect on the brain might convince you that that taking vitamin D is, is beneficial. Um, autism. Uh, John Cannell just published a, a paper in Medical Hypotheses where he looked at a lot of data that support the link between uh, having low vitamin D and, and getting autism. Um, 
uh, some of it's here, some of it's uh, here. Uh, I would say I did, uh, I did my own study um, where I um, looked at the latitudinal and seasonal variation of autism before 1985 and it found that, that again it was a disease which was more common for people born in February or March in various countries. Uh, but after 1985, the effect disappeared. And I'm convinced that that's because when countries started having these massive vaccination programs, that they increased the risk of autism either through the mercury in the, in the vaccine or, or just something else in, 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 in adversely affecting the immune system. I mean, if, 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 if infectious diseases are a risk factor for things like autism, then putting in vir uh, even killed viruses might have a similar effect. Um, unfortunately, this is a thing where Big Pharma has realized that, that vaccines might play a role in, in autism. So what they do, they went to Congress and had Congress pass a law indemnifying them and having the government take over responsibility for treating people with autism. And then they had people at the CDC who were able to cherry pick the data and say, this study, does not sh this study shows there's no effect of vaccine on autism. Uh, but in a private meeting, I've heard now from two sources, the same fellow from, fellow from CDC said, yes, we know the vaccine causes autism, and, and there are either 18, 1,800 lawsuits that have been settled or filed on autism. I mean, it's something like fifty hundred thousand dollars a year for treating people with autism. I mean, it could be very expensive for treating people with autism, and so the government doesn't want to res take the responsibility. So they're doing what they can to, to say it's not an effect, but I, I'm pretty sure it is. Uh, total mortality. mortality. Um, Philippe Autier and, and Sarah Gandini, uh, they, they work from Belgium, France, and Italy. For years, they've done studies on the effect of UV on melanoma and skin cancer. Uh, they, uh, Philippe works with the International Agency for Cancer Research. And uh, what was gratifying to me is to see people who, for years, have studied skin cancer and UV are now looking at the flip side. Uh, Bruce Armstrong and Anne Cricker in Australia, Philippe in, in France, um, uh, other people are saying, well, you know, we, we, we studied UV, we studied epidemiology, let's just look and see if there is a benefit. Maybe we can, maybe we can prove there is no benefit. But lo and behold, um, they looked at 18 independent randomized controlled trials, and they found a 7% plus or minus 6% reduction in the mortality rate for about a 500 IU per day difference in vitamin D intake. Uh, so they, they have, in fact, now Philippe is so convinced that vitamin D is beneficial that he's called a meeting of experts in December in, in Lyon, uh, France, the gastronomical capital of France, to spend a week looking at all the papers on vitamin D and cancer and come up with a monograph on the effect of vitamin, UV and vitamin D, including ecological studies. So he's, uh, I'm very glad he's, he's sort of Going to the coming to the, the bright side, leaving the dark side. <laughs> uh, here is an example: um, the people uh, on, on dialysis, some treated with vitamin D, some not. Those treated had a longer survival rate than those not treated. Uh, there is a recent paper on osteoarthritis of the knee, uh, finding some benefit. Uh, we we're discussing at a dinner. I haven't really studied uh, how. Vitamin D might, have, might be beneficial, but um, they found um, uh, less pain and, and better phys physical function. That could be effect on the muscles rather than on the joints. Uh, uh, yeah, knee pain and, 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 and walking speed. Uh, it may not really uh, affect the, the actual uh, osteoarthritis there. Uh, a new paper came out about a week ago on telomere length. Um, if you look at the data, there really is really a scatter plot, but there is a line going through the data that slopes upward. And what they concluded was that um, uh, the difference between the high and the low values of vitamin D was equivalent to five years of telomeric aging. Uh, I, I would, I tried to find quickly any data I could find to show that, uh, that countries that have more vitamin D and more UVB have longer lifetime. And so far, that, 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 that has eluded me. But uh, I mean, other things like smoking and diet and, and, and so on plays a more important role that it's going to be hard to find. Now, one of the studies I did for the indoor tanning people was to look at the benefit of vitamin D uh, on, on health. So I identified eight diseases, 
the cancers, the metabolic diseases, the infectious diseases, the autoimmune diseases uh, that look to have a benefit. And I estimated for most of them was around a 25 or 30 percent reduction in mortality rate from 2,000 IU per day taken over over a lifetime. And what I found was a, a 12 percent reduction, uh, plus or minus 6 percent of, of mortality rate and a reduction of 8% plus minus 4% on economic burden. This is direct cost plus indirect cost. Now, this is 2,000 IU per day over a lifetime versus 500 IU per day uh, difference over a four or five year period in the uh, meta-analysis I just reported where they found a 7% effect. So a 12% effect uh, uh, seems reasonable. Now, then you question, okay, 12% Reduce, reduce mortality rate. Now, does that translate to a 12% increased life expectancy, uh, lifespan? I don't think so. I think if you look at, this is mainly on, well, people die of these diseases at age 60, 70, 75, and 80. If you look at a 12% reduced mortality rate at age 75, that might translate to a one or two year increased life expectancy uh, rather than a, than a, a seven or, or 10, per, 10 year uh, life expectancy uh, increase. Um, we, it's interesting now that we're getting uh, support for the vitamin D uh, theory in uh, Canada. Um, the, the Cancer Society is now recommending 1,000 IU per day. The Pediatric Society is recommending 2,000 IU, IU per day for pregnant women and nursing women. Uh, the Osteoporosis Society in Canada is recommending 1,000 or so per day. Na the National Health System uh, Agency, whatever it's called in Canada, is deferring to the National Institute of Health in the United States for some reason, uh, which is in, in bed with the pharmaceutical co company, so they'll never find that vitamin D is beneficial. And so, but anyway, we've got three organizations there that are uh, uh, on the right side. Um, sources of vitamin D. Turns out if you just eat the normal American diet, you're going to get 250 to 300 IU per day. And as study after study after study has found, for hip fractures, for cancer, for, for anything, it prevents nothing but rickets. And so, you know, you'd have to drink about a gallon of milk a day to get uh, the recommended amount of, of, of vitamin D. And I don't consider milk and orange juice to be health foods. Uh, a lot of diseases are linked to the milk. Orange juice has too much um, um, sugar, not enough fiber. Uh, our cold water fatty fish are just a dwindling source, a resource. The world's fishing fleet is strong enough to harvest at a rate 4.2 times the, the replenishment rate for the fish um, in the stock. Of course, the fish contain mercury and other toxins. Uh, there's ultraviolet B radiation. It turns out a, a young, fair skinned person can make about 30 international units of vitamin D3 at noon in the Bay Area with 10% of his or her body exposed. Uh, uh, 1,000 IU per day. As you age, your ability to convert um, the cholesterol to vitamin D3 in your skin reduces. So older people, like my age, might take four to five times as long as a young person. Um, now, it is impossible to make too much vitamin D from UVB for two reasons. One is that UV, both UVA and UVB destroy vitamin D, and the other is you start producing other metabolites of vitamin D uh, that, that, don't have, that are essentially inert. Here's my curve of, of uh, the measurements on the rooftop in San Francisco of the vitamin D pr uh, production potential uh, every day. Uh, well, they made a curve uh, to show what it would be for every day. And what I found for 10%, it was producing around 65 IU per day for 10%, uh, 65 IU per minute for 10% of the body exposed. In the winter, it may be down to zero. There may be, the meter may not be accurate at low levels because maybe you're getting some UVA in. But, but uh, and then if you go out, if you, if you do like dermatologists say, and go out in the morning or afternoon, you're making vitamin D at maybe half the rate you would at, at, at noon. If uh, the older, older people like ourselves make less vitamin D when we're in the sun, are there data that show that older people are more likely to be deficient? Oh yeah. How much? Um, I mean, like, is it half? Is it? I mean, is it twice as many people older? Uh, 
the reason I ask is because we know that cancer increases with age. If vitamin D deficiency correlated with that cancer increase, then we can correlate vitamin D deficiency with the instance of cancer. Well, in my sepsis study, I did show that there was a, high, a very high correlation between the sepsis rate and the low vitamin D rate. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it did, in terms of vitamin D from, from sunlight, which is the main source of, of extra vitamin D for most people. Mm -hmm. So the, the very strong aging component there did correlate. And, and cancer, well, I should look into that in more details. Could, this is sort of a question that, that spurs further research, mm -hmm. and um, that would be a good one to look at. Um, I think it was probably, what, five years ago that Clara Felix reported that she did some studies of uh, ground level UVB in Oakland and found that even in the summer there was zero uh, because of the thick air pollution layer that laid over Oakland that came from San Francisco. So in San Francisco, the air was clean enough that you get UVB, but in Oakland it wasn't. Right, right. Also, if you look at the breast cancer and colon cancer maps of the United States, uh, especially in the 19, well, both periods, uh, 1956, 1970, 1984, along the West Coast, there's increased cancer risk, but decreased skin cancer uh, mortality rates. Again, because of the fog and the clouds and sometimes the aerosols as well. Uh, here, I've just thrown in a map of, of, of skin pigmentation uh, in, around the world. This is from Nina Jablonski and, and um, uh, George Chaplin. And they go around the world measuring underarm pigment to, to determine um, uh, normal, uh, the type of skin pigment people have without being in the sun. And, so in Africa, of course, they're very dark skinned. The Aborigines in Asia and in Australia are very dark skinned. The tropical people who live in the forest are brown skinned because they're not in the sun as much. And when you get to the Nordic areas, uh, people are very pale skinned. Uh, pigment uh, has several functions according to their hypothesis. One is to uh, be light enough to let enough UVB in to produce the vitamin D. Turns out black Americans maybe take five times as long in the sun to make vitamin D as white Americans and brown American maybe twice as long. The other thing is the UV protects against the, the generation of free radicals and the aging of the skin and the destruction of folate, probably uh, retinol or vitamin A. The problem we have, I think the reason that, that for example, they have so much melanoma in Australia and skin cancer, the way reason we're concerned in the United States, is that the pale skinned people move towards the tropics and dark skinned people move towards the, to the poorer regions. So the dark skinned people get rickets, uh, the rickets babies being born in Oakland, uh, the pale skinned people get melanoma and, and skin cancer. But one just has to be sensical about it and say, okay, we know what's happening, we can take appropriate action. Uh, sun beds, uh, they can be used as a source of vitamin D. They emit radiation with a UV spectral distribution similar to the sun. Uh, but maybe four or five times as intense as the San Francisco sun in summer. Uh, young people can, with pale skin, can make about 10,000 or more units of vitamin, uh, international units of vitamin D3 in four to five minutes, so they need not stay in 10 or 20 minutes. Uh, but there are risks associated with sunbed use, and it turns out my brown spots on my face are from several years of, of indoor sun tanning. Uh, here's a picture of Michael Hollick in a sunbed uh, a couple years ago. Now, he's the dermatologist at Boston University who was drummed out of his dermatology department by Barbara Gilchrist because he advocated uh, indoor tanning. He got $150,000 from the indoor tanning industry and was their chief spokesman for the health benefits. Uh, in a talk in, uh, I think, Vancouver, Victoria, uh, a few weeks ago, he said, don't go into a, a, a tanning bed unless you have a mask over your face and, and, a, and shorts on over your genitals because you've got to be worried about the, the adverse effects. And I, I believe him now on the, on the mask. It turns out they use high pressure uh, lamps near the face in a lot of the lamp uh, mat, in sun beds and low pressure along the rest of the body. I didn't realize the high pressure lamps were putting out more intense UV. So, um, uh, thing to worry about. The um, safest and most reliable source of vitamin D3 is through supplements. They should not be combined with vitamin A. In other words, you, often you'll find fish oil which has 400 IU of vitamin D3 a thousand IU of vitamin A. A study from Harvard and studies from Sweden have shown that over about 1,500 IU of vitamin A per day increase the risk of hip fracture. The reason is that the vitamin A and the vitamin D receptors are sort of co-located, and if you have too much vitamin A, it'll sort of spill over the vitamin D receptors, I suppose, and block the uptake of calcium and, and so on. So that's one cautionary thing.
here in Cal Dial measured, go to your doctor, go to some place where you have your blood drawn and send it to lab one or something and you can find your level. So what are the good levels? Uh, here's what we published in uh, 2005, um, uh, suggested that, um, see most people are in the 20 to 32 nanograms per milliliter range. If you think in terms of nanomoles per liter, multiply by 2.5. But most people are in the insufficiency range. Uh, with my taking 2,000 a day plus tanning once a week, I get around 60, 65. And don't have cancer yet, um, don't usually get the flu or colds, um, and so on. Um, okay, now what are the adverse effects of UV radiation? You get premature skin aging and brown melanin spots. Uh, you can get basal cell carcinoma, which is easily treated and seldom fatal. Uh, you get actinic keratosis, which are sort of red spots on your face. Um, they're just removed with liquid nitrogen in the dermatologist's office, or probably with chemicals as well. Uh, they will then, could turn into squamous cell carcinoma, which is a deadly form of, of, of skin cancer. And that's related to lifetime UV or B irradiation. You can also get melanoma, which is linked off to early life sunburns, nevi or moles, and, and, and UVA. Turns out the dermatologists did us another disfavor over the past few years. They were saying, when you go out in the sun, put on sunscreen. Unfortunately, sunscreen sold until this year did not block the UVA very well. It was blocking the UVB, so it was reducing the production of vitamin D. It was letting you stay in the sun longer, get more UVA. And what happened? It turns out that while the non-melanoma skin cancer rates went down by 50% from the two major periods, 50 to 69 and 70 to 94, the melanoma rates went up by 50, 50 to 90%. And the dermatologists kept, you know, didn't understand the difference between UVA, UVB, uh, and what was causing melanoma. And so they were telling people to go out and get melanoma without realizing they were saying that. Of course, then they can treat them, and, and so on. So, yeah, it's very, very specious. Now, I've just come on to a new topic, uh, the elastosis. Elastosis is a condition where the skin loses elasticity due to degeneration of the connective tissue. I guess it's the collagen? And elastin. And elastin, okay. And there are two things that cause this. Uh, one is smoking, and the other, and the other is, is UV. It turns out that starting in uh, about 2003, papers started to come out saying that smokers had a reduced risk of melanoma, which is surprising because uh, smokers have an increased risk of squamous cell and basal cell carcinoma, which is more related to free radicals and oxidative stress. Uh, but um, turns out um, also that, that um, if you look at um, the types of melanoma that form, it's melanoma on the backs and the less exposed areas that are what young people in their 20s and 30s and 40s develop. When they get to be in their 50s and 60s, it's the face and the neck. Well, the face and neck are more highly exposed, so they get more elastosis. The back is less exposed, so it has less elastosis. And Marianne Berwick, who was in New Mexico, published a paper in 2005, which created quite a stir. She looked at people in Connecticut and found that those people who had more sun exposure is measured by elastosis and whatever other approach, approaches you use, lifetime exposure, sun, sunburn, and so on, they had the better survival rates from melanoma. And she could decide then whether it was more vitamin D or, or more elastosis or whatever. But uh, now that we've, we've seen that these smokers have a reduced risk of melanoma and have increased elastosis, and it's a whole consistent picture, and uh, so we're writing a manuscript uh, to submit shortly showing that um, this is, explains why smokers and, and, and while Cedric Garden, for example, found out that the deckhands had less melanoma than the submariners back in 1990. And again, it's linked to the deckhands have more elastosis and the submariners you only get out on the beach when they get to port. Uh, so what this means for, for sunbed use is that even if there's a slight increased risk, uh, and the latest word is maybe 15% increased risk of melanoma, I think it's less than that because if you, if you take the fair skin people with freckles and red hair, they can't, they can't sunburn, and so if they get a sunbed, they're just gonna you know, sit there and burn. And if you take those people out of the, the equation, you have maybe a 10% maybe a increased risk of melanoma. 
But what this is saying that if you go to sunbeds and you, you age your skin, you're going to have a reduced risk of dying from melanoma, so it's, it's probably going to be a wash in terms of, of overall risk for, for melanoma. It's because the, the, uh, the sun and the vitamin D produced by it prevents the melanoma, right? It's not the elastosis that prevents it, is it? Well, according to Marianne Berwick, see, I was in a uh, meeting in Stockholm where Marianne Berwick talked about elastosis, and her, she just made an offhand comment that, that maybe it's because when you have elastosis, you don't have a substrate for the melanoma to, to grow on. You don't have a place for it to lodge and start growing. And, and so uh, that's independent of vitamin D. Well, well wouldn't the, the other hypothesis be plausible? Maybe we know that vitamin D reduces melanoma, right? But the fatal kind of skin cancer. No, we, we know that oral vitamin D is, was observed to be inversely correlated with, with melanoma. We don't know that, that UV produced vitamin D reduced the risk of melanoma. And, and this, I think, is a better hypothesis. Um, in fact, I, I can't show that UV. Well, I, I don't. But the, I don't like, know the evidence that melanoma is often occurred though in places where you don't see much sunlight. Because there's no elastosis there. Your vitamin, your vitamin D, your vitamin D circulates and gets to the skin wherever it is. I see. Okay. Okay. Now there are some adverse effects of vitamin D. Uh, in high doses, you can have calcium dysregulation. So you're putting, pulling calcium out of the bones and putting it in the soft tissues, such as the arteries, stiffening your, stiffening your arteries. How high is a high dose? Well, uh, Reinhold, maybe Reinhold Leith has said more than 20 to 40,000 a day for an extended period would be a high dose. Is that what you agree with? Without studying it further, yes. But I also say you want to look at the calcidiol levels. And I think if you start getting up above 100 nanograms per milliliter, you probably ought to be a little concerned. I'm not sure that's where the break point is, but, but I'll show some of the effects that you can look for. Mm -hmm. uh, it turns out there's a set of diseases called granulomatous diseases. No. OK. Anyway, these diseases. Uh, they generate extra renal production of calcium trial. That's the hormonal version of vitamin D, which is the one that's going to start pulling calcium out of the bones. Uh, and there may be kidney stones in susceptible individuals. Um, let's look at these in more detail. These are diseases that are characterized by masses or nodules of chronically inflamed tissue with granulations that is usually associated with an infective, uh, infective process. So um, this could be from tuberculosis, this could be from beryllium exposure, it could be from, from miners often get it, and probably from breathing the dust they breathe. Um, so these diseases include TB, et cetera, et cetera, both infectious and non-infectious diseases, even Crohn's disease, evidently. And, and so what happens is, um, as part of the, the immune uh, system, there's, there's local production of the calcium trial trying to fight that, that nodule, that infection, that whatever. And as it produces them, it's just going to leak into the, to the serum and go other places where it's not wanted, and it will sort of build up, um, uh, build up. And so these people really have to be very careful uh, with, with taking uh, vitamin D and being in the sun. Now Lyme disease is a disease which, um, there's a Marshall Protocol where Trevor Marshall has suggested that people with Lyme disease avoid the sun and reduce their vitamin D to, to zero. Well, he's making an analogy to these other diseases, and according to the latest paper I found, uh, there's still a, a, a question of whether uh, Lyme disease can be considered, considered one of these uh, diseases where you have to worry about vitamin D. He claims that his protocol is very effective for those with Lyme disease, I haven't seen peer-reviewed papers published on it, so I can't really comment uh, further. Um, there are some, you know, there are papers in literature saying that maybe it's a, a associated with, uh, with the problem. Now, uh, lymphoma is another disease for which uh, hypercalcemia or, or too much calcium has been reported, which could be due to too much uh, vitamin D. Uh, so there, there's a, a problem that I want to worry about in that, that disease as well. Um, Okay, how do you know if you have too much vitamin D? 
You might have generalized weakness and fatigue. You can also have this from too little vitamin D, like fibromyalgia and, and so on could be a, a vitamin D deficiency uh, uh, manifestation. There are some central nervous system uh, problems, confusion, difficulty in concentration, drowsiness, apathy, and coma, um, and other depression and psychosis. Um, so I don't think anybody here has all these symptoms. So um, is this extremely, extremely rare? Right. I mean, like one in ten thousand or one in hundred thousand? Probably. I I, I haven't. Yeah, I mean, it's, well, so, okay, there, there are cases where, where they put too much vitamin D in milk because instead of diluting it, they, they used um, a high dose and, and um, or the man, person making the vitamin supplement might, might put the wrong dose there. You're not going to get it from the sun, so it has to be a, a, a mislabeling of, 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 the, of the vitamin D. Um, it also get uh, soft tissue calcification. This one? Yeah, can you say a little more about the heart effects and kidney function problems? Uh, no, maybe somebody else can, but... Uh, no. Pardon? Which? Heart, uh, heart and kidney function problems. Oh, with the uh, vitamin D? Well, it's probably, the heart is probably calcification of the, of the heart valve, right. the soft tissue, and the kidney, I'm not sure what the problem would be there. You can also use these glucocorticoids, which are used for treating inflammation for rheumatoid arthritis and so on. One of the side effects of using that, that, that um, compound is that it reduces uh, calcium, and, and, and so they tell people uh, taking that to take more vitamin D and calcium to, to counter it. So it, it works both ways. If you, have, uh, if you have too much vitamin D, you can use it to, um, and too much calcium, you can use it to reverse the process. Yes. Is there any interaction with vitamin K, K2? Excellent. I'm not aware of that, but maybe Bernard uh, knows. Actually, they work in, uh, there's a new one coming out called MK7, which actually works very well. I'm personally a testify to that. Uh, with vitamin D3 together in MK7, they've shown osteo uh, bone um, you know, growth in, uh, in osteoporosis, rheumatoid arthritis. It's excellent with disc, herniated disc. I've used it uh, a lot with uh, cases in herniated disc. Just those two alone is, is incredible. So vitamin K is going to be the next, it's going to be like vitamin D. It's going to be the next revolutionary uh, vitamin that's going to come out. You'll see it. The K2, it's called MK7, it's the new one. And that's where you're going to get higher activity, better results. And I've had amazing results with hip regeneration and herniated disc patients using a combination of both. Okay. So it's further work to do. Uh, I need more prospective supplementation. Uh, the opponents uh, recall the false hopes for beta carotene in which they gave found people who, smokers who, who took more vegetables in their diet had less lung cancer. They isolated beta carotene and they got more lung cancer. So that sort of soured a lot of the people on, on vitamin supplements. Um, we should be able to get more uh, information on fighting viral infections and sepsis. Um, and I think that anybody who has cancer should be given uh, vitamin D to help um, treat the uh, cancer. Um, here's some uh, information from 2005. Um, uh, I like this part here. Um, professor of Emeritus of Dermatology say, I like to have wine with dinner, but I don't think I should drink four bottles a day, which means moderation. Um, so we now are recommending 1,000-2,000 IU of vitamin D3 per day. Uh, Solar UVB is the primary source for most people, but you don't have to irradiate to the point of skin cancer for the benefits. Uh, 
the other sources are, there are other sources, supplements is probably the, the, the most reliable. And I'm hoping that public health policies on UVB and vitamin D would be revised in the light of these emerging scientific findings. Unfortunately, our disease treatment system is very resistant to this idea. Now, I have one copy of the book, Solar Power, still for, uh, out there for sale. This is written by um, Mark Sorensen, and I provided the uh, foreword to it. Uh, it's current as of about a year ago, and as you realize, it's a very rapidly moving field. So uh, he's coming out with a new version in a few months, and we'll be updating a lot of that. Thank you. There is some talk of having loading. If you're a little low, then you take uh, like uh, 100,000. Yeah, it, to bring your level up and then <coughs> right. You comment on that? Yeah. Um, if you're low, you should be. Yeah. The one way you can take 50,000, 100,000 IU of vitamin D3 per day for first a week, a two, a month or so. Uh, I'm not sure how long you'd want to do that. Um, I mean, if you're very low, I mean, it's probably possible to figure out what that loading would be based on the lifetime of vitamin D in the body. And I could go through the calculation, I don't have it offhand, but once you do that, you, know, you should back off and maybe 5,000 a day after that, and have your, your syrup calcidiol measured, and take about a week to get your results back. But um, you'd want to probably take, measure your calcidiol before you start that, and then after you've done it for about a month, and then sort of adjust your dose accordingly. What level would you then say you should come to? Well, I like 60 to 70 nanograms per milliliter, which is where I am. And I think that's been shown to have great value in reducing the risk of viral infections, cancer, and so on. Uh, Jim? Yeah, I was going to say, if you, if you load up, like some people will take maybe 10,000 at one time, and then uh, the next week they'll take 10,000 at one time to have it go into the fatty tissues at that point. Where does it interfere with the metabolism of vitamin A, or does it? I think it's more the other way around. The vitamin A interferes with the vitamin D. Uh, I'm not really versed in that. I mean, when would you take the vitamin A? Pardon? When would you take the vitamin A, then? Uh, I, I can't answer that. I, I'm not an expert on vitamin A. Steve? Has anybody looked at the selenium correlation with the China finding with vitamin D to see whether or not maybe that's the compound variable for China? Uh, Yes, um, I published a paper on cancer in China a few months ago in which I had data on dietary and serum selenium as well as iodine and, and calcium and all sorts of things. And I don't recall that selenium played a role. I can go back and revisit that. But the data, Colin Campbell uh, and, and colleagues collected those data around 1980. And the cancer data from a little bit before that, the dietary data a little bit after that, but they still correlate. And I could look at that. I, I think there is a, a problem with selenium and, and AIDS and SARS and AIDS in Africa, SARS in China. So I think it is a, is a concern. Yes? So in the wintertime now, with no UVB in this area, what, what's the sun doing to sure? Well, it's giving you UVA, which is not very beneficial. What is UVA? Oh, that, that generates uh, free radicals, which gives rise to melanoma aging. <laughs> and aging, aging wrinkles. So, uh, uh, so you basically don't want to get the sun in the winter. Well, you're not going to get much health. I'm not sure there's much health benefit from being in the sun in the winter. Uh, if you want vitamin E, take supplements. Yes? Have you ever had a user of a company minimize the uh, skin aging effects? Well, uh, okay, how do you reverse skin aging, or how do you prevent skin aging in, in North Tanning? Uh, a lot of the aging comes from free radicals, and you, uh, some people suggested that you put a topical solution of vitamin C or other antioxidants on. Uh, you could also probably just take, um, make sure you have a good antioxidant supply either from supplements or from diet. Um, so that, that's what I'd recommend, one of those two. I mean, you, could take, you could certainly uh, take things like a lot of beta carotene or a lot of carrots, but then your skin starts turning orange, and you're blocking the absorption of UVB and vitamin D production, so it's sort of counterproductive, <coughs> but you're not going to burn. Yes. So, Bill, like, if one is deciding the best form of D to take, whether to take, you know, like this, in this particular case, 10,000 units sublingually versus a tablespoon of cod liver oil 
you're saying that this would be better because of the fact that the receptors of, of the A and D compete for each other. Right. Because there, there was a time someone said to me, oh, cod liver oil is a more a whole food or something, and that's the, your best source of vitamin D. But I, you know, I'm not. Well, okay, cod liver oil just has too much vitamin A. It has a fish oil, which is beneficial, but the manufacturers often put more vitamin A in than the fish had originally. <laughs> um, uh, and, and you do, uh, I think that if you take vitamin D, you want to take it with lipids somehow or other, yeah. in oil base and peanuts and coconut oil or, or whatever. Yeah. Yes? Uh, trying to understand the difference why you favor supplements versus sunlight. Sunlight effectively takes it through the pathway all the way to the calcifiable active form, which has a blood uh, half life of three to six hours. If you take a supplement, you're just getting B3, you got to go liver, kidney route. D3's got a like, 24 hour uh, serum half life. I know you talked about the weeks in the in short and fat, but in terms of it never really takes it that less step to the active form, as well as the, the half life. I mean, it, it, it is very short, and so the sunlight actually, you know, you're getting the active stuff that activates the VDR receptors. No, I don't think that's quite correct. So we, we did a study with a UVB lamp a few months ago, and we had people in for one minute a day for four or five days measured their calcidiol levels at the uh, one day later and found they'd increased by maybe five or seven or ten nanograms per milliliter, came back a week later and they got up another five or ten nanograms per milliliter. So there was a, a, a delayed effect in getting from the skin into the, through the uh, um, liver into the blood. But calcitriol, the sun is not involved in calcitriol. Uh, the skin essentially metabolizes all the way through the trial. Mm -hmm. Well, but not in the serum. No, no. The, the, the trial is made in the kidney or the organs. It can be made in the skin, but that's the major source in the, in the serum is through the kidney. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't see the sun. Yeah, well, the sun will take it through and you can get 10,000 IU. Well, the vitamin D, the cholecalciferol that you take in a supplement form is the same as produce, is produced in the skin and put in the serum. Bioidentical. The D2 is the artificial one, which I don't recommend right, taking. I'm not talking about D2, I'm just talking about but D3 that. is D3, whether it comes from sheep's wool fat or, or from, from, from fish oil or from the sun and your own cholesterol. There's, there's, um, nobody has shown that, that there's a difference in bio, no, no difference in the biology. Yes? If fish oil has mercury in it, Right. If you're worried about mercury, you look for a brand of fish oil that, that says it's highly purified, <clears throat> taken from salmon in, in Alaska, or, or somehow they purified that mercury out. But that, that's a concern, but, but you can find brands that don't have the mercury. Yes? Okay. Yes? Yes, yes. Yes? But didn't you just say that it's probably not a good idea to get your vitamin D through um, fish oil because there's also too much presence of vitamin A? Well, that, yeah, my preference is to get it from, from supplements that are other than fish oil. I mean, I'd rather take the fish oil separately from the vitamin D. Yes? I missed your autism. Exactly your view was uh, that is it the vaccination of the children or is it the mercury tumor swelling? Well, okay, on autism, um, I think there's good evidence that mercury is playing an important role. There, there, there's a, a family, uh, either father and son or brothers, uh, guy or G I E R, and they live in the D.C. area and they publish study after study where they look at things. They looked at California. And I think they're able to show that after mercury was removed from from the vaccine in California, the autism rates went down somewhat. Uh, but there are other studies suggesting that it's just uh, maybe the vaccine uh, independent of the mercury. Um, and the mechanism being giving the virus to the child. Yeah. The yeah. That's in my hypothesis. I don't think I can point to a paper in literature that, that says that. But there's a lot of. I think when Gary Gordon was here, he talked about mercury. Yeah, the, the symptoms of mercury poisoning, the symptoms of autism being very, very similar. So I think the evidence for mercury is very strong. Yes. Does vitamin D have any effect on the biological clock? 
Okay, the question is, well, does vitamin D have any effect on the biological clock? I think not. Uh, I think the main effect is blue radiation. There's a third receptor in the eye that's sensitive, peak sensitivity to the blue at 425 nanometers, and that effect goes to the uh, pineal gland and affects the serotonin and melatonin production. And when I travel, like if I go to Moscow in the summer, in one day I can be on their time. If I go to uh, 68 degrees north latitude in Sweden in the winter, I'd be there two weeks and never change my, my clock because there's not enough blue light. So there's a little effect of vitamin D maybe on mood, but I don't know that it really affects the biological clock. Are you saying that the blue light makes you change time frames or keeps you from changing? I'm not okay, blue, okay. Yeah, some people sort of advance an hour a day, some people retard an hour a day, some people say come. So if you get the blue light in the morning and the afternoon, it will help set your clock at whatever period your clock must be set from the blue light. The mel you have more melatonin at night, and so when you don't have the light, you have more melatonin. But if you don't have the less melatonin, I guess you're not resetting your clock. Does that make sense? Not yet, and the reason I'm asking is because I use blue light to control my sleep problems. Okay. And, and recently I've noticed, um, you, with this particular my go light thing, you can go online and you can give your your set of problems and then it'll tell you when to use the light and what duration. And most recently they shifted me from using it in the evening time to actually using it in the morning. Okay. Which I thought was fascinating because I've never had that effect before. And it worked very effectively and, and for obviously a different reason, but I don't understand it, so that's my question. Well I think it's turning off melatonin then. If I'm using it in the morning, it's right. turning off melatonin. But you get more melatonin at night when there's less light. Um, I did experience on two different occasions um, uh, minor and major insomnia from taking vitamin D at noon in 50,000 unit doses and the, the, the serious insomnia taking it with dinner. Um, and so you may want to be careful about that and take it early in the day rather than late in the day if you're going to experiment with very high doses. Okay. Mm -hmm. Question? Phil, uh, two things. One is on the autism. I attended a uh, seminar about a year ago at a conference on autism, and a wonderful part, um, film was shown on the actual cause of autism that was done by the University of Calgary. It showed that mercury from vaccines actually was one of the key uh, causes because it damaged neuro the uh, neuropeptides in the brain, also the neurophils in the brain, and actually caused neuro damages. And it's, one of, it's been shown by the University of Tabler that it's now proven to be a major cause of autism. So vaccines have caused that. The other thing on another study that was done at, in Australia several years ago, where they took 200 uh, people and they put 200 in one group, 200 in the other group, and they gave uh, one group aspirin and the other one a placebo, and they all went out in the sun. And the one with the aspirin, one hour before going in the sun, had no uh, some uh, burning signs of the skin or <coughs> any aging of the skin where the other ones did. They had uh, inflammation, burning, free radical damage, all that. And it's published in, if you look into the Australian article on sunlight <coughs> and aspirin, you'll see it there. So taking an anti-inflammatory, even like Tylenol or aspirin, prior to going out in the sun does protect you. And doing the same thing with UV uh, beds it does protect against the, uh, the inflammation because it, it, what, what happens is it, it's the inflammatory that causes the damage okay. on the skin. That's and also, if you take, eat a lot of polyunsaturated fats, they found that people weigh more fats, uh, polyunsaturated fats, versus saturated fats like coconut or butter or cream had less damage on their skin than those who ate like corn, oil, any of the other oils, they had more damage, free radical damage. And it's been published on several papers. That's a good point on, on uh, anti-inflammatory drugs. Um, but there's a cautionary note that aspirin can lead to, to GI bleeding. And so it depends on how you take it uh, and exactly. when you take it. Diluted in water and just uh, sip it so, uh, uh, you know. Yeah, I learned that late in life. Yes, so they found know. even 20 minutes cost damage. And then they found that it wasn't a time relationship Also, uh, aspirin is a copper chelating agent, and the tanning process in the skin is a copper-dependent enzyme. So there could be an involvement in that level. 
Yeah, well, first of all, in the tropics, there's less ozone, and second of all, the sun is at a higher angle, so you have much more intense uh, UV there, UVB. So potentially less of some kinds of cancers there then? Right, we've uh, just published a paper on endometrial cancer showing that there's, if you look at the global distribution, there's a U shape with a minimum in the tropics, mm -hmm. and we've shown that it's both a function of dietary factors and of solar UVB. Um, We've shown this for kidney, renal cancer, um, and one or two other cancers as well. Yes. Uh, the the latitude thing, have you ever considered ex vivo effects of UVB in terms of disinfecting bacteria, viruses, bacterial viral monitors, simply in the ambient atmosphere, topically, things like that? Uh, yes, we wrote a paper about 15 years ago about how when they have a, a smoke pall in, in, in the Amazon, it blocks the UVB and there are more mal malaria or something else develops because it isn't killing the mosquitoes and the bacteria and that sort of thing. So, <laughs> the UVB actually part of it maybe also the infected and disinfected the yes. infection of the ambient environment in addition to the whatever internal uh, yes. mosquitoes have. Right. magnificent book here. I don't want to carry these home sports, man, so step up. You can drive carefully, everybody. Thank you, guys. <laughs>